was beautiful. Beautiful worship. Thank you, worship team. So can I ask, we, we're, uh, again, our, our, our theme this year is, is Heart Like Jesus. And it's one year of messages based on the life of, and teachings of Jesus. One year. We're sticking with the life and the teachings of Jesus, all of our messages for this year. We want to have our hearts align with his heart. And, and so that's what this year is about. And today's message is called The Lost Opportunity. And it's going to be based on John chapter 1. And um, I'm going to read the first 18 verses of the, the, the book of, of, of John chapter 1. And I would ask that you please rise right now with me in respect for God's word. I'm going to go ahead and read all 18 verses if you'll follow along. Please rise to your feet. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 6. There was a man, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe in him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light, the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was, verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out. Excuse me. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. This, This message... And this passage from the book of John, I wanted you to, 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 to get the whole thing because there's a lot there about Jesus. There's a lot here that gives us a glimpse into our Lord and his, and his life before he was born and, and, and before he lived, before he was born as a little baby. And, and, and it says that all things were made through him. All things were made through him, Jesus Christ who came. And, and there's some powerful stuff there that we need to grasp. But, but we're going to focus in on three verses from this passage today. And, 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 and as, as I do that, one of, one of the things I want to do is I want to I remind you, what year is it? 2020. 2020. Do you see clearly? Yes. 2020 vision. Anybody have 2020 vision in here? I know I don't. I have those kind of glasses that, you know, they have to thin them down because to, to get the extra. But if you saw how thick they'd be without, you know, taking that extra step, you got to pay an extra $150 to get them really thin. Otherwise, they'd be about a half inch thick or something like that. 2020, seen clearly. 
I want to call on us, on God's people, to see clearly this year. I want to call on God's people to see clearly what God wants you to see this year. And, you know, in America, this year is an important year. It's an election year. You know, I don't get political from the pulpit. And so this is as political as I'm going to get today. This is my political talk right now. America is very divided. It's not the most divided that the country has ever been. The country's been more divided. The Civil War, for example, it was pretty divided then. And, and, but it's a very divided country right now. And I was watching a, 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 um, a PBS documentary this past week, and it was an interview with Frank Luntz, who he's a Republican pollster. And, and um, so you have these two kind of dynamics going on. PBS, it, it definitely leans to the left, and you've got their interviewing. The whole um, thing was, was an interview with this, this Republican pollster. So you've got the left and the right in this one thing, and both perspectives are coming out there. And one of the things that, that they, they asked Frank Luntz a series of questions, and one of the things they, they were talking about, this thing about a divided country. And, and as he's been doing polling for, for the GOP for about 30 years, very well known in, in, in those circles. And um, he, he, he uh, Frank Luntz, uh, he, he embittered himself to, to our current president, Donald Trump, by saying, criticizing some things that he said early on, and so they, he, they, those two had no love for each other. He's going like, he went too far in something he said, and, um, and so those two have no love for each other. Um, but but as, as, as Frank Lutz was talking about our divided country, uh, I think he said some important things. He, he talked about how he was, he started by saying how he was at the inauguration of Barack Obama in 2009. January 2009, you know, one year from now, we're, we will have just inaugurated the next president of the United States of America. A year from now, like just this week, was when, they, when, when the inauguration would take place. And he was talking about how he was at the, at the inauguration of Barack Obama and remembering what it was like. He goes, there was so much hope. And in the country, there was a lot of hope because Obama's platform was hope and change. And, 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 and a lot of people got excited about that. The first black president, there was, there was this optimism within the country saying, you know what, we, 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 the past is behind us and we're, we're going into the future, a, a future that, that, that is, is filled with promise. And, and that, was, that was one of the things that, that, um, that, that you saw this sort of ethos in our country around the election of, of Barack Obama. And, and then and while he was at this, at this inauguration, he, he said, you know, a lady recognized him as the Republican pollster. And the lady said to him, she said, so what are you doing here? This is our day. This is our president. And, 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 you know, that stuck with him. That stuck with him. And, and that's how, how divided people get over politics. Where, where, where you go, what? Like, whose country is it? Who, should, who, ha, who can be at the inauguration? What? Isn't this America? Why would you say that to someone? How could you say that to anyone in America? And you, you imagine the thinking that, that kind of goes, goes on. And... You know, we, 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 we live in a time where things are so divided, and you know what doesn't help? Because everybody has an opinion. What doesn't help is social media. Because social media, everybody has a platform. And everybody puts things out there on social media. They, they, they put their opinion out there, and, and, and they, 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 you know, they say things. You know, the, and, and when people... When people it's, it's amazing how the, the, on, on Twitter, my goodness, sometimes if, you, if you're on Twitter and sometimes you just go, that's cancerous. That thing's cancerous on Twitter because it's like the, 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 the main place for the division of, of politics in America. And, and if somebody does the wrong thing, some public person, then, then you look at what's trending on Twitter and, 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 and that becomes a big deal and it actually affects so much and then people come back and then they apologize and... Oh my goodness, you, you, you have 
uh, because everyone has a platform, it makes it even more divisive. Instead of just the media voices, the, you know, the 15 media voices, you got a million, 10 million, 100 million voices. And you know what? It's beautiful that we all can put our opinions out there. But I'm telling you, the divisions of our country are so nasty. And, and, and I've had conversations with people about politics that, that, that turn so nasty because, because people, because you disagree, because you disagree. And um, disagreement doesn't have to be about disowning a person. Amen. Disagreement doesn't have to be about belittling a person. Disagreement doesn't have to be about devaluing a person. And, and, and so politics is ground zero for devaluing people. And, and, it's, and it's a sad, sad, sad commentary. And I want to call us as, as, as believers, I want to call us as believers to, 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 to answer the question, who are your loyalties to, your politics or to Jesus? Because, because those are very, very different things. And if, you're, if, you, if your loyalty is a higher loyalty to Jesus, then I believe there are times with your politics that you need to zip it. There are times with your politics that you need to just shut up and go vote. There's times with your politics that you just need to get it done, but, but, but don't put it out there. Because right now, you put it out there, and there's people who won't listen to you anymore. Would you like the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with that person? I promise you, if you lead with politics, you won't get the opportunity to do it. If you lead with politics on your Facebook and your whatever, your, your Twitter and your social media, if you lead with politics, you lose the opportunity to influence people in the name of Jesus. And so I want to talk for a little bit. I'll use that example as to, to get us started. This is called the lost opportunity. The lost opportunity. And, 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 and if, you, if you think of the name of my sermon, in what I just described... That was a lost opportunity. When you lead with politics, it's a lost opportunity to share the love of Jesus with someone, with a group of people, perhaps many people. And, and so, so I want to zero in as we get started, on, and, and I'm going I'm to pick apart three verses here. In verse 11, it says when Jesus came, it says he came to his own. He came to his own. When Jesus was born, when the light came into the world, when the word was made flesh and came into the world, he came unto his own. Jesus was born ethnically to a Jewish family. The covenant people of God of the Old Testament. Among all the nations, colors, tribes, clans of the earth, Jesus went to his own people the Jewish people. And, and he went only to that, pe to that group of people with the message of God's love. And, and, and as he did so, I want to I I say this. We know this about God. God created all of the nations, tribes, colors, ethnicities. He created them all. And so we know this about God. God loves variety of our skin colors. God is the one who did it. And he loves it. He loves the variety of our cultures. And, 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 and God is, is into, into, into people and the nations of the world. Very much so. And it's a beautiful thing. The red, yellow, black, brown, and white colors that we have. And... and one of America has, is often called the great American melting pot. The melting pot. Why is America called the melting pot? Because it was the first nation in the history of the world that was founded not by, because of the color of people's skin. Every other nation in the world is about the color of people's skin. Every nation. Only one nation of all the countries on this good earth was founded on something different. It was founded on an idea, an idea called liberty, a, an idea that, 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 that believes that all 
humans were created in the image of God. And, and, and that every person of all colors are, are endowed with certain rights that come from, not from the government, but come from God himself. Amen. Liberty is a gift from God. <laughs> and so America was founded on these principles, amazingly. We, 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 live, we live in a country that, that was founded on these principles. And it's a beautiful thing that our country was founded on, on such principles. And, and so the nations of the world are welcome in America and flock to America and have flocked over these 300 years. They've flocked to this country. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Every year, we, 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 let in, we bring in so many immigrants from around the world, more than any other country in the world. Even under Donald Trump, we let in more immigrants under, under Donald Trump than, than any nation on the planet. It's amazing. Yeah, praise God for it. It's, the, the nations are welcome here. And, and, and it, it's a picture of the goodness of God and the abundance of God. And, and so when Jesus went to his own, it wasn't that the Jewish people were in any way, shape, or form better than any other nation or any other tribe, creed, or people. It, it was that those were a chosen people. God chose from among the nations one nation to be his, repre his representatives in this in, in, of his love in the world. And so, so the people of God were these Jewish people. And it says, Jesus came unto his own. He started with them. And, and he came to his own. And, and, and interestingly, you know, the Jews, you know this if you know, if you know history, the Jews, they shouldn't even be in existence anymore. They shouldn't even be alive anymore. There have been, they've been, try, there have been kings, dictators, other, other nations that have tried to wipe them off the planet over thousands of years and haven't been able to do it because those people were chosen by God. They were chosen by God. And, and so they exist today. The, 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 the hate couldn't destroy them. Animosity and evil couldn't destroy them. They still exist. And so Jesus went to his own. And, and, and Jesus went to them with one more opportunity because all through the Old Testament, God, the story of the Old Testament is, is God, God saying, Israel, go and be a light to the nations of the world. You will be a nation of priests that represent my love to the world. And the Jews kept not going. They kept coming back and they wouldn't go. And they, they actually thought that they were better than the other nations. They thought that. And, 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 and so when Jesus went to the Jews, when he came to his own, among all the tribes, he went to them. And it was a great honor that, that Jesus went to his own. He went to the Jews. And, and it was a, it's a great honor and responsibility for any people to represent God to the world, for every people to represent God to the world. And, and, and so, because the Jews didn't receive God, he kept trying to, 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 to reach out to them. Because they didn't, they didn't respond to God, he kept trying to reach out to them. And so here it was, the Son of God himself goes to them. And when God shows up, it's an opportunity. Amen. It's an opportunity. And, and, and opportunities, you don't get to choose opportunities when they fall on your lap. You get an opportunity, and sometimes you just got to run. You got to run with it. Because if you don't roll with the punches on the opportunity, you're going to miss it. And opportunities don't keep coming and coming. So, so, so when opportunities show up, you got to go with it. And so, so if you're ready for the opportunity when it comes, then you seize it. And those who are not ready miss the opportunity. And, 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 and every day people miss opportunities. You may be able to think of some opportunities in your life that you've missed out on. And you go, man, looking back, I should have done this. I should have gone down that path. I should have taken that job. I should have. Hopefully, it's not about your husband or wife. Like, well, I married the wrong one. <laughs> Hopefully. When you are distracted 
opportunity doesn't wait for you. When you're not ready, opportunity doesn't wait for you. When you're blinded by your busyness, opportunity doesn't wait for you. you got to be ready for the opportunity. And so if you're overwhelmed and you're oblivious, you're going to miss opportunities. So it's in your best interest to have a posture of readiness, especially when it comes to God and the opportunities he brings. When God shows up, it is very likely inconvenient. When God shows up in your life, it's not going to be at the easiest time. It's not going to be at the most convenient time. It's going to be when you're busy, when you're stressed. It's going to be when you have responsibilities to keep. But, but, but that's the thing about opportunity. It belongs to those who embrace it. It belongs to those who seize it. And those who are ready to say yes to the best will get rid of the rest. You know what I'm saying? So he came to his own. But what, how did his own respond to him? In the second part of the verse, it says, and his own did not, what? His own did not, what? I can't hear you. His own did not, what? His own did not receive him. The opposite of receive is reject. His own rejected him. To reject is to deny, to forfeit, to let go, to lose. Any fans of the Godfather in here? Any fans? We, we got a few. Any? All right, we got a few. We got a few. The Godfather, if you ask me, one of the greatest movies ever made. Godfather 1 and 2. 3 is great, but you don't like it as much because it's about the downfall of the Godfather. It's, it's, it's about the downfall. But so, so let's just let's, let's stick with one and two over here. So, so the Godfather 2, there's, 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 there's this amazing scene. For me, it's the most memorable scene in the movie. There's actually two, but, but uh, two is highly memorable. But I'll say this is the most for me. And, and in this scene, after the Godfather, Marlon Brando's death, Michael, his youngest son emerges, and actually while he was dying, Michael emerges as the new godfather. So the youngest of the three brothers and the sister, Michael emerged as the godfather, Michael, Michael Corleone. And so, so played by, by Al Pacino. And so he rises to, to the head of the family. His older brother, Fredo. Oh, Fredo, Fredo, Fredo. You disappoint me, Fredo. I knew it was you, Fredo. I knew it was you, Fredo. Fredo. Remember that scene at a New Year's Eve? They're in Havana, and, he, and, and it strikes midnight, and then, and then Al Pacino grabs Fredo. He gives him a, they give a big embrace to each other, and, and then he grabs Fredo, and he says, Fredo, I knew it was you. He gives him a big kiss. I knew it was you, Fredo. You let me down. Well, there's a scene... Another scene that, that the two of them are talking, and it was, it was on, the, on the heels of, of, of a big deal that, that Michael was making with Hyman Roth, and, and there's this big multi-million dollar deal that they're about to make. And, and, and somebody gets to Fredo, one of the enemies gets to Fredo, and goes to Fredo and finds him in Beverly Hills and, and asks Fredo some questions about his brother and about his brother's plans. And Fredo, he tells Fredo, he says, Michael's being really, really harsh on this deal. He's being, he's being you know, in the negotiations, he's being really hard. And, and so we need your help. Give us some information. It'll be good for your family. It'll be good for the family. The family, because this is... How many people am I talking to who have never seen The Godfather? Who've never seen The Godfather? Oh, people. Oh. Please, please discipline yourself. Go, go see it. Please rent The Godfather. It'll be Godfather 1, three hours. It's an investment of your time. Godfather 2, three hours, an investment of your time. Godfather 3, three hours, an investment of your time. 
please go see the Godfather. Oh my goodness. So many great things about life. So, going on. So picture, even if you've never seen it, you've got an older brother who's jealous of a younger brother who's now the boss. Fredo is the older brother. Michael is the younger brother. Fredo is, is jealous of, 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 of Michael. And when, when he gave this other person information about Michael, and Michael finds out, and there was a hit on Michael's life through it, but Michael survived, and, and Fredo goes, I didn't know there was going to be a hit, Mike. I didn't know. And then he goes on, and he's trying to make excuses, and he's trying to present himself like, I'm just, and that's Fredo. He's just always oblivious. He doesn't get it. He just misses it. Maybe he does get it, but he pretends he doesn't. And, and so Fredo, Fredo, there's, it's part of this scene when, 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 when uh, Michael's asking him, he's interrogating him about what happened. And then Fredo says something. He goes, he goes Mike, he goes, see, I did it because, because Johnny said that there would be something for me if I could help make this happen. If I could help, there would be something for me. And, 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 and Michael asks him, why did you do it? He goes, Mike, there was something for me. There was something for me on my own. And, and, and Michael says, Fredo, I've always taken care of you. And then Fredo, Fredo, he says, he says, taking care of me? You're my kid brother. Taking care of me? And he goes, you ever once think about how that sounds? My kid brother taking care of me? And he gets real dramatic. Michael, just like his father, the godfather. The godfather. No emotion whatsoever. You disappoint me. No emotion whatsoever. Nothing. Fredo's getting all worked up. Michael not giving him anything. And then once, once Michael realizes that what Fredo has done and why he did it, listen to these words. I'm going to read the words exactly what Michael Corleone said to Fredo, his older brother. Fredo, you're nothing to me. You're not a brother. You're not a friend. Still very calm. I don't want to know you or what you do. I don't want to see you at the hotels. I don't want you near my house. When you see our mother, I want to know a day in advance so I won't be there. You understand? And he walks away. As Fredo says, Mikey, Mikey. So Fredo was effectively no longer in the family. And to lose your family identity is a big deal. It's an important thing. To be lost from your family, to be kicked out of your family, to not be welcome in your family is tragic. And here you've got this, this scene that is especially tragic because you've got an older brother who wants respect. He wants so desperately for somebody to respect him. And, and he can never get respect. People think of him as stupid. Um, I could have, part of that scene, that's the scene where he says, I can do things. I'm not stupid like everybody thinks. That's part of his passion too. And, but Fredo is stupid. He is the stupid brother. Everybody refers to Fredo as the stupid brother. So you just give him things to do on the side. And he doesn't, his family tolerates him, but they don't value him. And no one values him. And it's super tragic. So in this passage, when it says that his own did not receive him, Jesus went to his own people and his own people did not receive him. His own people rejected him. His own people kicked him out. His own people murdered him on the cross. His own people had him beaten, put it through a bloody trial, a, 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 a sham trial that wasn't even a real thing, complete with, with witnesses that lied and brought 
crimes that Jesus never committed. His own people rejected him in such a way. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But, but there's, there's something here to this opportunity. To lose life with God, when you reject God, is no joke. There's a finality to this lost opportunity. And it's a big deal to go through your life and miss opportunities for yourself, but it's an even bigger deal to miss the opportunity to live life with God. It's a bigger opportunity to receive Jesus. And, and so this God-sized chance at new life that Jesus brought is, is, is bigger than everyday missed opportunities because embracing Jesus is something that you carry into the next life. Embracing Jesus, it, like, it, let me say it like this, rejecting the Son of God is a rejection that you bear for eternity. The Jewish people on the whole rejected Jesus. And they rejected their mission to take the love of God into the world, to the nations. But God made a way for the nations to have the opportunity that the Jews rejected. And, and so now, people from every tongue, tribe, clan, and nation are followers of Jesus and have received Jesus. And this room is a great example of it. And, and, and so, so now it's not just the Jews, but there are Jews who received Jesus. And, it's, and, and, and there are people from every nation who receive Jesus, but there are more from every nation who reject Jesus and, and who do not receive Jesus. And so, so I want to I go ahead and, and go on to the next verse. In verse 12, it says this, but, sometimes a but is good and sometimes a but is bad, right? Right? So, so, so on the heels of those who rejected him, there's a good but here, right here. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Children of who? God. Children of who? God. Children of God. Children of God. Say it out loud. Children of who? God. Amen. So, so let's think about this, this word receive now. Let's, let's play it out. The word receive, so we all understand what it means to receive Jesus. For all who did receive Jesus, to them who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So to receive is to accept, to secure, to seize, to take hold. You have to take hold of Jesus. You have to say, yes, I want Jesus, and go for him. If you do not, then you don't have him. You have to seize Jesus to be, to, here, let me give you some, some, some uh, uh, sentences with the word receive in it, some examples. She received her prize from the manager. She received her prize from the manager. Her poem was well received. The rulings have received widespread acceptance. Representatives of the club will be received by the mayor. Received. You, you get the idea. Receiving is this thing about embracing something. Receiving is, is, is about securing something, seizing it, going for that opportunity. Becoming a child of God is a right for those who receive Jesus. Did you get that? Becoming a child of God is a right for those who receive Jesus and only for those who receive Jesus. And, and, but those who reject Jesus do not have this right. Are you with me? You understand? Okay, so all people are created in the image of God. Every single person is created in the image of God. The scriptures tell us that. Every single person. There's not a person you'll ever meet that's not created in the image of God. But not all people are children of God. And, and so there's a disclaimer there about how you become a child of God. 
And, and, and so I want to say this, you, you, being that you have, to, uh, you have to choose Jesus in order to become a child of God, so you have to choose to be a child of God. Let me say it that way. You have to choose to believe in Jesus. You have to choose to say yes to Jesus, and then you're a child of God. And only then are you a child of God. So, so we can look at all people and go, created in the image of God, dignity, they're worthwhile, they're valuable. Every person that you'll ever meet, even persons that you don't like, even persons you're annoyed by, even those people that, that you see in public, the people who cut you off, even that person. Everybody you meet is created in the image of God, but not all people are children of God. And so the way we treat people matters. Because they're created in the image of God, the way we treat them matters. Because every person is created in the image of God, the way you treat them ought to be very intentional. How should you treat a person who's created in the image of God? When Christians see all people the way God sees them, created in His image, then it changes the way we see people, it changes the way we treat people. And, and so the way we treat them is greater because they're created in the image of God. Are you with me? Can you say that word with me? Greater. 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 We treat them greater because they're created in the image of God. And, and so we, a greater respect for the unbeliever, a greater grace for the unchurched, a greater compassion for the poor, a greater desire to befriend the lost. Greater, because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Amen. Greater, because greater love has no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said that to his disciples as he was preparing to lay down his life. Greater, because great is the Lord. Say that with me. Great is the Lord. Remember what I said about election year. It matters. Created in the image of God, it matters. Do you want to cut yourself off from the opportunity to speak to people? You know what? You know what posts get the, 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 the most attention are the controversial, the negatives. Right? Yeah. The controversial things, the negative things that people say. Most of the time we don't notice the good things, but find ways to say good things. Find ways to lift people up. We are children of God. We are created in the image of God, and we are children of God. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. When we embrace Jesus, we are children of God. Now, here's the part of this scripture that, that holds the, the, the paradox, this Oh, can you go back, Josh? Sorry about that. I'm going to read verse 13. Verse 13 says this. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Yes, but of God. The paradox is that children of God are born of belief, not of blood. That's the paradox. You were born into your family by blood, but you're born into this family Amen. by belief. Amen. You're born into this family by believing He is the Son of God, by believing He is the Savior of the world, by believing He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. There are times when a child has to prove their relation to the bloodline in order to receive the benefits of being part of the family. Let's do a blood test. Let's make sure. And then the father says he'll give the child support. Human reasons why children are born. Sometimes children are born very much on purpose. A man and a woman get married and say, I want to have a child. I want to have children. And then men and women do what they do to have children. And they have lots of fun doing it if they do it right. 
And uh, the, uh, children being born on purpose are always born into love. Are always born on to, into love. And, 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 but sometimes children are accidents. Oops! Didn't mean to. Man, Marcia and I, David, wherever David is. Oh, he's out ordering pizza for us for afterwards. David was an oops. Big oops. We just got married. And, and, and we, I, I went to Bible college, and we, were, we, we, we moved to Springfield, Missouri to go to Baptist Bible College, and we were broke. I mean, when we, when we left Southern California to go off to Bible college, we had my little 1987 Toyota pickup truck with a little shell on the back, a, a U-Haul attached to it, and everything we owned was in there, and a few thousand bucks in our bank account. And that was it. That was it. And, and then we, 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 we went at this, and I was going to school full-time and working full-time, and Marcia was working, and so that was fine. But then we, Mar, I come home from work one day, and Marcia is talking about pregnancy tests. And we're both going, what? We were 23 years old. Uh, 23? 23? 24, 23, both 23 years old, and, and, and when, when we found out that she was pregnant, we both went, oh my goodness, how are we going to make it? How are we going to get through this? It's like, man, we, we, we were focused on, you know, getting done with school and surviving, and we, we were both, no joke, we were both very sad. And, and we had to kind of get over it. We had to get over it. And then after a while, we got over it. And then, and then David was born. And Dave, David was, our, was our, our, uh, one of our bundles of joy. We have our three bundles of joy, all of them beautiful, amazing. We love them all. And um, they always argue about which one's our favorite. And we say we're all our favorite. And they come to us in, in private all the time. They say, I know I'm your favorite, right? <laughs> well, Sometimes they're born by accident. Sometimes they're born on purpose. And then there are the reasons that God has children. It's always the same. It's never by accident. It's always on purpose. When God chooses us, when God has children, he chooses us. And he wants children. So he made a way for those who receive Jesus to become his children. We become the chosen when we choose. (laughs) When we choose Jesus, we become the chosen. That's a paradox. (laughs) And, and so God doesn't have children by accident. And, and so I want to say this. I want to I tell you about a couple of things that as I've, as I've sought the Lord for our church, I asked the Lord, Lord, will you give me a word that, that, that I could bring to our church that, that, that could be a word for us to grab hold of, a word for us to seize and make our own? And, and, and that word that the Lord gave me was emulate. Emulate. E-M-U-L-A-T-E. And, and to emulate is to copy something. And this is a call to be like Jesus. Now, now we don't actually have the grace, the, the, the strength, the courage, or the imagination to be like Jesus. Not one of us has that on our own. It's actually impossible for a human to be like Jesus. And and, and so, but the impossibility becomes a reality because of the grace of Jesus that he showed on the cross and the forgiveness of Jesus that he showed on the cross. Because in his death he gave us grace and forgiveness, the impossible, becoming like Jesus, is now possible. And, and so it is the Father's desire that we, his people, emulate the Son, emulate Jesus. And so it's a worthwhile pursuit to emulate Jesus. And, and it is possible because of Jesus' sacrifice. Can you say that word with me? Emulate. 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 Now turn to your neighbor and tell them to emulate Jesus. You know, there are two things that our church needs to be about. 
two things. If we get these two things right, everything else falls in line. If we get these two things right that I'm about to give you, everything else falls in line. Everything else takes care of itself. But it's these two things. And these two things will define what a successful church is. These two things. And it's these two things only. I wouldn't put anything else on the list. If we get these two things right, we got this covered. So are you ready? You should write this down. One, that we hunger for the presence of God. That we have an insatiable thirst for the presence of God. That we get on our knees and beg God to show up. Lord, we desire your presence. We want to be used by you. We want to be vessels of your goodness and love in this world. Lord, guide us. Lord, we're hungry for you. Lord, we want you to want Jesus like there's nothing else that you ever wanted. So first, an insatiable hunger for the presence of God. And the second thing is that we have a strong commitment to reach the lost. A strong commitment to help people find faith in Jesus who have no faith in Jesus. If we get these two things right, we got it all covered. But if we don't have an insatiable hunger for God, is it still ticking? Are you with me? And, and, and these two things are what it's about. And so I want to, as we close our service, I just want to give an opportunity to, to, for, for anyone who wants prayer for you right now. And um, we have a few of our folks that are going to come forward right now and be ready to pray with you if you'd like to respond to God. We want to leave this opportunity for you to be able to respond to God. And so I want to ask a couple of our, our, our folks who can pray with folks to come up here up front and just be ready to receive anybody who needs prayer. And in this moment, if we can have nobody walking around, 